Uh, we're here today with Greg Shea and Cassie Solomon to discuss their new book, uh, Leading Successful Change. Greg, Cassie, thanks for being with us today. My pleasure. Thanks, Jeff. So you start off the book and you begin with a bit of a paradox. You say, we live in a world of permanent change, our main jobs are change, yet most organizational efforts to succeed with change fail. Uh, can you talk about that a little bit? So I think part of the challenge of being where we are, uh, just in the history of the planet, let alone the history of, of, of business or of modern organizations, is that we're in a place that much of the change that is occurring is simply picking up speed for any number of reasons, from advances in technology, the autocatalytic nature of that of that change, changes in the financial market, uh, changes in globalization, that it just has become uh, a more and more turbulent, uh, turbulent environment that we're in. So that precipitates more and more change, which exposes us to what we don't do particularly well, which is to do that not just uh, in a one-off fashion, but to do that repeatedly. So uh, the pressure to get good at it shows us what we don't do particularly well, which is we're not as good as we need to be at it. Uh, and I think that uh, that that pressure is actually a, a skill that people in organizations, including leaders, but not limited to leaders, have to pay conscious attention to. This is a key skill. In fact, one can argue uh, that it's the key skill for people is uh, we assume that you can do the parts of your job that used to constitute your job, namely keeping the place running. Uh, but today, people assume that, and the rest of it is, what are you doing about, and whether it's installation of a, of a, of a new information system, have you, made, have you dealt with changing markets, have you been able to open or close parts of, of, of your organization, new parts of the organization, reach to new parts of and new markets, have you been able to adjust to changes in the workforce? All of those things end up being how we often think about a person's job. We assume the other stuff. So, all the, the change piece has become more prominent. One can argue it's your real job. Uh, but we're not, uh, what we're exposing is that we're not particularly good at it, particularly when we're talking about being able to do it uh, agilely, uh, do it in a way that's sustainable, uh, do it over time, do it repeatedly. So I think it's an outside pressure is, is, in, is uh, providing the occasion for us to see our limits in terms of, of doing this, doing change. Interesting, interesting. And in the book, you talk about the lead dog myth. Uh, and the role of a, a leader, or, or maybe the myth of a leader within change efforts. Um, what is the lead dog myth, and, and how can leaders uh, avoid falling into that kind of trap? Well, let me take a shot at this, and then I'm sure Cassie will have something to, something to add. Uh, there's, there's a way in which uh, we tend to over, over ascribe in general uh, what may be an uh, indication of a system to the characteristics of an individual. So this is a particular example of something that I think is a broader phenomena. So we look at, well, if it didn't work, it must be either because you as the follower weren't motivated or it must be because you as a leader were not inspirational. Uh, what we know is that, yes, that can be part of it, and there's a wide literature about how to, how to go about leading change in the sense of inspiration, communication, et cetera. And I'm not trying to say that's not important. However, in the end, human beings are much better at adapting to a changed environment than they are to try and be pushed into, into change. And we underattend to that. So when we say it's all about the lead dog, that myth is that, well, if you don't see good change, either you've got a problem with a leader or you've got a problem with a follower. Suggest that really in the spirit of, uh, and then in the tradition of systems thinking, which key parts of it came out of Wharton, Eric Trist, uh, Fred Emery, uh, that that if you think about it from a system standpoint, the place to start is not at the, at the, at the leader or follower. It's mm -hmm. to say, what's the environment that you want to set around people that would make a certain set of behaviors make sense to them? Because human beings do well, much better at adapting to environments than they do being told to change in a way that may or may not make sense with what the world around them, their workspace, their strategic business unit, mm -hmm. their service line, indicates that they should act. So, you tell them one thing, uh, the world around them tells them another thing, people are pretty intelligent. They'll go, well, you'll come and go, but the world that's a re immediately around me, my reward system, measurement system, uh, they're telling me to do something else. Uh, so they'll do the something, 
they'll, they'll do the something else. And so I think we, we under-attend to that, and that's part of the reason, back to your first question, that our record for change is not so good. So we, we put too much on the individual, whereas I'd, I'd suggest, and Cassie uh, and I in our book suggest, that it's far more useful to think about the work of leadership as a critical part of that is including how you're going to design the work systems or the environment around people to make the kinds of behavior that you want to see make sense to them. That's a key part of leadership. If you don't do that, what you do as a leader is you're pushing against what might make sense to people day to day. And that's not only not going to work very well, hence the numbers that you quoted at the beginning, but it's also going to create a strain and even break your relationship with your followers. So I just want to um, I want to sort of add to that from a different perspective. I think this is a very accessible uh, set of ideas. So if you think about I'm going to change my behavior. I'm going to go off to a productivity training or a time management seminar, and you can feel very inspired and and motivated, and you know make all kinds of resolutions. This is right in line with the New Year's resolutions research. And coming out of the box, you feel like I have changed something inside of me because I've learned and I'm motivated. And we know because of research that it doesn't it doesn't last. And the most dramatic example of this, I think, and it's in the book, is people who are recovering from bypass surgery. Now you think someone has just sawed your chest open, right? And you're motivated to change your lifestyle, but the statistics are extraordinary. It's like 94% of people don't make those changes. So it, we believe it's really not about getting better at motivating. It's not the charismatic leader who can convey a sense of urgency, you know, explain the threat to your workforce. This is where burning platform stuff can come in. Because you can, you can have those dramatic experiences and still step back, you know, there's been a kickoff, you've launched an initiative, you've poured yourself into explaining charismatically why everything needs to be different. And it's, you know, the middle of February and you've forgotten it was the New Year's resolution that was just left by the wayside. So becoming more of a designer of the environment. So using the same examples, how do I design the environment around myself to change my behaviors for time management? How do I design the bypass patient's environment so that it's easy for them to make the lifestyle changes? That, that's a different approach. It's a very different way of looking at change. And people get really excited when they, when they learn it. They they like yeah I get it because we've all experienced this even in our own in our own lives. Sure, and it can connect back to our personal our personal experiences. As I think about the work systems model that you've laid out, then is part of the implication that bold change um, might have better success. If you had a choice between setting up a more dramatic change and doing it in a way that you can line up enough of the environment around people that it makes sense to take the, the bold move, uh -huh. that's more likely to be successful, we'd argue, than a change that was a much more limited change, but you only change one aspect of, of the environment. Uh, and so people say, well, it's, that seems irrelevant to me, actually. Why would I pay attention to that little piece mm -hmm. that you want to do? So. Uh, it's, it certainly is conceivable uh, that bold change could be easier mm -hmm. if you can do the work that you need to work to do to get the, the environment around, it, around the individuals to change enough so it makes sense for them to engage in what you're looking for them to, to do. And can I just add, because this is a point you made earlier with me, which I love, which is it's got to be bold and aligned. Right. So I think we, we right. often find ourselves called in, I'm thinking of these as like, change management turnaround situations. And you've mm -hmm. got this silo saying, oh, we're going to have this bold change and this new technology, this is a bold change. If these things are you know, canceling each other out, like a signal and noise mm -hmm. problem, just being bold is not the answer. It's thinking about a coherent and aligned system that drives change. We actually fall into a trap, I think, uh, uh, regularly in that w in order to try to make the change, quote, more manageable, we do make it smaller, when in fact we miss the point about what the actual change is. So uh, a, a typical or a common example, I should say, of that is there's some new software, perhaps business enterprise software that people want to install, and the change gets defined as simply about the software. Well, that seems like it's big enough, but actually that's not big enough because the change really is you want a set of people 
making a different set of decisions, using a different kind of information, with a different set of objectives, with a different kind of collaboration, using different skills that happen to be connected with the installation of this new information system. And that actually feels like a bigger change, but for, for the tens or hundreds of millions of dollars you're putting into the, the software, you actually should be thinking about the change bigger. Because if you think about it smaller, what you're going to get is 10% of the functionality is going to get used about the software system. People aren't going to see why they should change their behavior. They're simply going to be compliant to the information. Where what really we're trying to do is change patterns of behavior inside the organization. So bigger in that case could very likely be more likely to be successful than smaller in that case. Okay. And the work systems model that you present in the book gives readers an opportunity uh, to look across those set of factors. Right. right. And but we use it to, we use it to design with with groups mm -hmm. and sit down and say, all right, you know, tell us what it is you want to see, and then use this almost as a checklist. You know, design with all of these elements so that it's coherent, um, and it's people understand it once they've learned it, and they they sit back and come out with pretty radical things, actually. And, and so I think that the way, one way to think about the book is it's both a framework, which we've been right. talking about, as well as a technique, which we try to be specific enough in the book so that both are accessible. So how you think about it as well as how you would do it. Right, and, and part of that technique, and maybe I can ask you to describe this uh, briefly now, part of that technique is about really envisioning what the future looks like and importantly, the set of behaviors that are occurring in the future. Um, what advice would you have uh, for a reader who's trying to put him or herself that, that far into the future? Well, again, let me take a cut at this and I'm sure Cassie's gonna have something to, to, to add to the, the points. Uh, a couple pieces that, that we know of, there are various kinds of techniques for trying to do envision, envisioning or visioning of the future. Uh, in common with those, one aspect is you want to get far enough out into the future so you can free people up from, from the present. So if you want to get change to happen, by and large, you don't want to work from, well, how do we improve the present? Because you've already got a whole bunch of constraints built in there and you're not going to get people to be as creative as you can be if you can get far enough out. So whether one is talking about back, back casting or idealized design, you want to get far enough out temporally that people get freed up to then think about what might we actually create. So that'd be one piece of, of counsel. The second piece would be, and this is what sets, I think, this technique uh, apart from others, is to, to work hard to envision as if you were a playwright. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, what is the scene that if I saw it, I'd know we've gotten to the kind of place we want to get to? Uh, and and that's actually, I think, in the whole part of, of what we talk about in the book, that's the hardest piece for people to stay with, is to push to the specificity of what you actually want to see. How would you know it? Who's in the room? How are they talking? What tools are they using? What measurement system are they responding to? Th that kind of specificity is not there to then end up being deeply prescriptive, so somehow you, out you're going to tell people this is the script you've got to follow but rather it helps to set up the second part of the model, which is to help be diagnostic in, a, in, a, in an acute, in a, in a, a precise way, uh, diagnostic about, well, if that's what we want, and that's clearly not what we're seeing in terms of how the field and headquarters or how R&D and sales, whoever it is that you might put in that scene, how they deal with each other, if that's not what we're seeing, Let's assume that it's not because of those people. We can get back there if we have to, but let's assume it's because of how we design the system. So what would we have to do to make it make sense to those people to behave in the way we just described we'd like to have, but it's not the way that it's happening? If we've done the work around the scene and done the work of trying to be precise about that, now we have what we need to do um, a, a pointed analysis of the systems around people that we need to change. If we don't do that work in the scene, then we're left with platitudes or vague, and it makes it hard to do the more detailed planning about what am I actually, what do I have to actually do to create the environment that makes the behavior that I want make sense to people. Got it. Got it. Well, that and I lo I'm so glad you went there because I was sitting here and thinking, I want to give everybody like a vague button that they can learn how to hit when they hear it, you know? So what is it you're trying to actually do here? Oh, I want people to collaborate. What does that look like? And, you know, you get all these agreements at this 50,000 foot level conceptually, 
everyone is going to say, oh, yes, we definitely, we just had a merger and acquisition. We definitely want everybody on both sides to collaborate. And we, we nod our heads and walk away, and then we say, gosh, what happened? You know, what does that really mean to people? What does that look like? What's the behavior we're looking for? If you bring the conversation down to that level, you might discover you don't have quite as good agreement, and you have to keep thinking and working. And one of the ways that uh, you highlight this in the book is with the examples uh, that you've raised, right? And, and two of them really stood out to me. And Cassie, if I can, I'd like to ask you about them. Um, the first was fostering innovation at Whirlpool. And the second was about how to sustain the customer service success that Disney has seen for so many years. What I was really struck with was how these were change efforts that were born out of success as opposed to crisis or failure. Um, how should leaders of successful organizations uh, think about change? What I, what I love about the Whirlpool case is the CEO had tried to change Whirlpool's culture. It's really a culture case. Um, two or three times, and it was really towards the end of his tenure, he said, oh, I'm going to take one more run at this thing. You know, we've been an engineering company. We're geared that way. I need to be customer focused, and we need to be innovative. And it took it took years, partly because I think they started more um, modestly and then just kept adding layer after layer of system change um, and building all of the ingredients that actually create culture such that three years into it, they had really seen tremendous impacts to the bottom line. And what, what's great about that, if you're a successful leader, you see the changes coming, the kind that Greg was describing. Before the crisis hits, before the burning platform arrives, you want to begin to move. And the model gives you a way of designing into that future without having to wait for panic to set in all the way down through the ranks. That's too late to start a change like this. It's going to take, especially a big culture change. Disney is kind of the opposite, partly because our friend Walt had that vision from the beginning. And he, he just was a holistic thinker. He wanted environment to convey a certain quality of guest experience. They designed feedback mechanisms for people to understand the guest experience. If you read the history of how they built the customer satisfaction experience there, and now they tell other people how to do it, um, it really includes all of the ingredients that we discuss in the book. Mm -hmm. and, uh one of the things that was really helpful to me as I was reading it was all of a sudden I was thinking about sustaining success as a change process as well. Oh, can I, can I take that one? Because we push changes into our organizations because I'm thinking about hand washing in hospitals, which is just a horrifically difficult change to incorporate. And as long as you're bearing down and sending the message, you're getting the behavior you want. But if you turn your attention away, you know, six months later, it's, it's slid back to, to the baseline. And that really requires this kind of re-engineering of the environment, I think, to hardwire the change. One thing I'd, I'd add to, to what Cassie's talking about is one of the choices we make uh, is what are you going to use as the emotional energy for change, right? So we come out of a, a period which I, I actually think this is part of the issue of having done this for as long as I've done it. Uh, you, you, can, you can remember when it might have been different. So I, I think one of the products of the 80s uh, is that w we associate developing either sense of urgency or what I would term felt need as based on fear. People have to, I mean, just the very image of a burning platform, right? Let's take a human being, put them on a platform, and light it on fire, and that's how we're going to get change to happen. Uh, and that language came out of the 80s, which was a particularly difficult, painful time, uh, radical restructuring, lots of layoffs, all that was going on in the U.S. economy. That's one way to go about fueling change. And, and yet, when you do that, we know that when people are very anxious, when they're scared, you can get them focused, but at the same time, that's not the way that you get the most innovative, creative, because anxiety up, intelligence down. Uh, Another way to do it is what, more to what we were doing before that, which is that we were thinking more in terms of what are you trying to create? What's the hope? What's the dream? Uh, put two men on the moon or put a man on the moon and bring them back, say, that type. And, and if you're trying to change an organization that's successful, it's hard to use the lessons from burning platform uh, because where are you going to create that? And even if you do, you're going to buy a set of problems. That's fine if they, you actually have a burning platform. 
But what's the other way to do it? And the other way tends to be uh, much more in terms of what would you like, as good as we are, what would we like to see? What are the things that we're not seeing here that we'd love to see if we could see? Or we've come this far, what's the next thing? And so you can use this technique that we're talking about either when you're working off of more of a fear base driven by the world outside, or maybe it's in the, in the framework of success, you're trying to construct what's the next place? Where's the hope or optimism that we can generate given our success about what might be even better that we could create in the world, uh, what it would be like to work with each other, or what the type of connection, or how do we get the next 10%, or how do we go from the playoffs to the championship, whatever image one wants to use. And so I think when we think about this, this process and winning organizations, that's something that isn't isn't talked about in part because we haven't gone back and changed the constructs that we formed in a very, very traumatic and painful period of time. And I don't think we've quite adjusted or balanced or calibrated right. And hopefully the model, uh, I think, provides a way to do that. So. Thank you. Uh, as we think about as we think about organizational change efforts tonight, speaking personally um, as an organizational leader, uh, I appreciate what you've said about expanding our view beyond leaders and followers uh, to really in, encompass the whole environment. Um, I know the question that I often face, though, is how much is enough? How much of the environment um, needs to be shaped? How do I know uh, what or what are the cues to let me know that we're making progress towards our goal? So the, uh, the only slightly flippant answer to that would be, uh, you've changed enough when people experience that they're in a different place than they were before. So the, the kind of clinical judgment is do people say, whoa, this is different. I'm in, a, I'm, in a different, I'm in a different domain than I was before. To get to that place, our counsel is that you at least start by thinking of changing uh, four of the eight dimensions that we talk about, or levers, uh, you change at least four of those. And uh, then you're into a, in, into a judgment about is it, well, if I could change six, kind of, is it as good as three dramatically? And, and the point is not that there's something magic about the four. But in the end, we come back to the, my first point here, which would be people whose behavior you're trying to change uh, should experience that they're in a different environment than they were before. And our accounts would be that's probably going to involve a heavy pull on at least half of the d dimensions of, of, the, of the work environment, which would be four of the eight. The more, the better. Can it work with you? Yes, but it gets harder and you got to pull harder. And, and so we're in an area where hopefully uh, if pe people who do research on the model will end up clarifying exactly what the answer to your question should have been, Jeff. Right? But that's, a, that's the best cut currently. Okay. Um, well, this book functions really well in describing a relevant, accessible, uh, conceptually sound approach to leading change in organizations. Um, for your readers, how would you suggest they use the book? Often. <laughs> In fact, the entire Perhaps family. With multiple with every, copies. Yeah, multiple copies for everyone would be the way they should use the book. Well, actually, speaking of family, I, 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 we couldn't put this in the book because they would never speak to me. But once you learn to see the world this way, it, you can see the whole world this way. And I, when I'm teaching it, I talk about waking up and going, yeah, I got this scene going on with my pre-teenage daughters, and this is not the scene I want. You know, how, wait a minute, like, I teach this stuff. How, how should I rethink this? And how do you know you've gone far enough is because I went about halfway and went, oh, not there yet, you know, and redesigned the environment. So I think that once you understand the theory, you go through this tempting period where you look around and say, oh, my organization, oh, you know, my, my, my sleeping habits, oh, my family, you know. Uh, and you can you can see it everywhere you look, which is cool. Uh, another another pass at this uh, would be uh, there, I think there are two major ways which go back goes back to something we were talking about earlier. Uh, one is simply as a framework. So if 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 you if you think of the world just in the way that that Cassie was illustrating, if I'm thinking about it in terms of systems that comprise the environment around me, just doing that is a different way of, of approaching this. It's consistent with the best out of, of, of the tradition of Deming and Duran, where they said, don't, don't blame an individual when you keep putting the individual in and new individuals keep having the same problem. Think about the system. Uh, so just having that orientation uh, in and of itself is a use. Uh, the, the, the other way to use, or another way to use it, is to very consciously work your way through the, through the, 
technique and to, to follow it in a, in a far more, uh, far more um, linear fashion of working through the different steps, although it's never done, there's always cycling back through. Uh, and, and to that point, um, you know, one of the, we mentioned in the acknowledgments about our gratitude to the different organizations we've worked with and support, and uh, there's nothing like working with somebody, uh, particularly people who are pressed for time, which most of us are in organizations today, and they'll say, say more about that, that's useful, right? And the encouragement you get from that. Well, related to that is when you walk around an organization and you see at different levels in the organization, they got a copy of the model that we have um, uh, stuck over their desk, right? And, and, it's, and it's being used in those two ways. It's just a reminder to think about the world in that fashion. And there may be particular projects that they're involved in, whether it's a business enterprise system or whether it's, whether it's a merger, where they are using this in a far more detailed project management guidance kind of, kind of fashion. And I'm reminded of one of our clients coming up to me and saying, hey, hey, I figured it out, this worked, because we changed all eight, you know, and kind of showing me like this piece of paper where he kind of mapped the, the framework onto what we had actually done. And that's right, so how, just so happens that that group designed a really different system, and it worked, and then he was able to map it back to the, to the model. I think one other use that I throw in, we, we have a chapter where we talk about different uses of the, of the model, as you know, uh, is I think particularly back to where we started the conversation, when you're in a world that's got this much pressure to change, going through the use of this model can lead you to the point where you say, you know, we can't change enough of the work systems to make this thing work. And it's a, that can be a valuable contribution. So you either say, well, let's go back and figure this out again, or you say, not now, not here. We, we got other things we can be doing. So as a basic sorting device, even if it leads to a point where you say, I don't think so, we can't really do this. Uh, given the number of change initiatives, threats, opportunities that are present in the world uh, around, almost any, um, around almost any business, that I think is a worthwhile use just in and of itself. And from what I hear, you'd likely have a chance the next day or the day after that to but use to, the framework some, again. But the thing you just decided, you well, we can't do this, let's do that, let's try it on that. Yes. Right. All right. Exactly. Well, Cassie, Greg, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. Thank you.